Welcome to another Melbourne Coco Heads presentation. Recorded at the offices of realestate.com.au on May the 12th, 2011. In this session, Luke Tupper speaks about the book App Savvy by Ken Yamosh and how he applied what he learned to his own iPhone application. Um, recently, oh, first explanation of who I am. Um, I'm an independent contractor, developer. I've um, been doing Mac OS and uh, uh, iPhone stuff um, for a number of years now and occasionally do um, .NET stuff if people pay me enough money to do it. Um, it's, it's getting more and more, you need to pay me more and more. It's not worth the pain and suffering. Um, I recently picked up this book um, called App Savvy. I can't remember what Twitter post, blog post, whatever, um, that uh, uh, mentioned it. But uh, um, it's a book by um, Ken Yamosh. I don't know the name. Um, <clears throat> and the basic principle of the book is that it's about taking an idea and all of the steps that you need to make um, taking an idea through to the actual putting it in the store, evaluating it after the store, working out whether you should keep working on the um, uh, app after it. Um, so um, I'll run through the, 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 the chapter headings. Evaluating idea, preparing to build an iOS app, creating a concept, development, working app, making your app better, and beta testing, launching, marketing, and tips and tools. So development, I know that we're all developers here, um, but uh, the um, development was only a small part of this book. If if you're one of the, I know there are some people here who are responsible for more than just, they might be building their own app that they've launched into the app store, um, or you just want to know more about what the other people around you in your team who are dealing with your app should be doing or, or might be doing, then this is a great book. So, the, and the, the development section is actually the shortest chapter because um, uh, uh, they pretty much just sort of go, Development, hire a really good developer, and if you want tips and tricks, tips and tricks on, on doing good development, there's a ton of other books out there. So they're very, um, very specifically avoided going and saying this is the way your app should be developed or um, or what you need to know. There's a whole lot of information actually for um, non-developers about what they should be looking for when they hire a developer. So. For those people who are trying to market themselves as a developer or trying to get into the contracting game, another good thing to read. Um, one of my um, favourite things in the, in the book, um, it's about, well, I don't know how many pages it is because I bought the ebook version, but um, the book has pretty much for every chapter has two or three um, interviews with um, uh, app developers. Um, so for example, um, talking about concepts, they had the guys from Schmill are inter interviewed. Um, concept design, they've got the guys from Balsamic. Development, they've got tap, tap bots. For launch, they've got tap metrics. And for building your marketing, they've got the guys from tap, tap, tap. And uh, finally, for measuring success is, the, is an interview from the guys from Flurry. So some really, even, even if you um, uh, aren't interested in reading the information in the book, just simply reading the book for the, um, uh, for the interviews that are um, in the book uh, can be well worthwhile. The other thing, I'll mention it now, I think I've got a note to mention it at the end, but if you buy it on the Amazon Kindle store, the book's $3.99, so it's not as though you're buying a, a, a $20 book or a $50 book to... <laughs> so, um, so um, what I'm going to talk about tonight was a couple of things. So, if you don't want to buy the book, three three ninety nine might be too much. Uh, that a couple of things that uh, I put in an app that we recently released, um, and uh, so this was a couple of ideas, and they, they didn't come out of the development section, thankfully. Um, a couple of ideas that uh, I put in an app that um, uh, we released. So I'll just give you a quick rundown of the app that um, 
uh, we, um, we released. It's called My Cinema. It's um, built for the Independent Cinemas Association of Australia, um, who basically everyone who has a cinema that isn't Greater Union, Hoyts or Village. Um, and it's an app that allows the um, cinema owners to get the same sort of leverage that Hoyts and Village get off their iPhone app or Greater Union um, have one as well. Um, and allows independent cinemas to uh, get the same advantages of the size that, um, um, uh, as I said, Hoyts and Village. So you, Hoyts and Village, you can look up in their app, find out what sessions are on and see you know, what movies are available and they can do the same thing in my cinema. Um, and yeah, basically, you can look at your nearby movies or your favourite movies. Um, and at this stage, we've got a pretty good selection of cinemas in, uh, in Melbourne, New South Wales, um, Queensland and South Australia. We're still working on WA. There are people don't have any yet, but uh, we're working on But um, the first thing I got out of the book um, was the section on analytics, which is something that for stuff that we've done on websites, we do a whole lot of work with analytics. And our um, iPhone apps, we pretty much uh, don't do anything. And, and I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about us as a collective here, but um, in the book, they mention five different um, uh, analytics. Um, they all have different qualities in terms of how well they work, the quality of their reporting. Um, we chose uh, Flurry for our app. Um, it has a native API. It's pretty easy to get going and um, it has pretty user-friendly stats straight out of the box. Um, so there wasn't much mucking around and people can understand what's going on. So I'm going to just give a hopefully a quick uh, rundown of um, getting going with Flurry. So any of you who um, haven't, who've tried to put analytics into apps before or haven't thought of it and I think they should now. There was some back and forth about whether UDIDs are legit to be sent by apps to servers and Apple had some crackdown on that. And it was a lot of, specifically was there some debacle with Flurry, like Apple had some... Yeah, they, 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 they changed their API to, to yeah. make, it, make it make okay with that. <gasps> I, mean, I, I think there's two different ones. There's like a non... Location-based and location-based and location-based and you, 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 you now have to specifically add the location into the app. So it wasn't was, was so much about location, but about the UDID. Yeah, they don't send the UDID anymore unless you do... They don't send any specific information unless you ask... You, you can, if you use the sort of the other API that's like a bigger one, then, then you have to tell the customer, I need, I'm need. i going to use your stuff. That has to be like a checkbox, and that, that covers Apple's thing. But technically, you can still grab your ideas. You can. If you have your yeah. own server side, you can I, I, I you think can. I think what it does now is it generates a GUID and sends a GUID, and it just remembers the GUID in the app. Um, so the first thing is you register your app at flurry.com. Basically, you have to give it the bundle identifier, and that's about it. They give you a unique key. I've got no idea whether people can do nasty things with the unique key, so I just hit it from you. But the unique key is a... I don't know, 20 digit text and, and numbers. And they, they also give you the, the information about installing um, the app. Um, basically, you have to import a header file and a, um, a file to link to. In your, the very bare minimum for your app, all you need to do is import the API and then run this. Um, uh, class method flurry API start session at and your unique user ID and that gets you going in terms of some pretty basic stats of how many users, <coughs> what type of phones they've got, that sort of thing. Um, you can then add a custom event, event and one of the things in our app is that a cinema, a user can make a cinema their favourite, it can also unmake it, unfavourite their app. So we want to track every time a cinema's made a favourite or not. So all we need to do is log an event and uh, we give it a, a reasonably unique string. Um, one thing to note, Flurry has a limit on the number of events that it can track. I think it's about 300 or 400 events for, per app. Um, so you don't want to have every event that ever occurs having a very unique string like user started the session at 552. 
Um, but if it's, in our case, cinemas, we've got about 40 cinemas in total. So in, in total, this, these two lines of code will generate about 80 custom events, but they're events that we actually report back to the cinemas themselves. Um, finally, the, the other thing that I also use it for, um, and uh, it's already been uh, some use, is you can get Flurry to catch any except exceptions for you. So for any of you who um, put your app out in the, in the field and uh, are waiting on it coming back through the iTunes Connect uh, mechanism, this will actually um, allow um, you to get any uncaught exceptions and it seems to come through a little bit quicker than it does through iTunes Connect. You have a cool stack trace. Um, not that I, I'm not, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like, but uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I've been dug into. I've only had one exception in the, in the field so far. So, um, unfortunately, the latest version of my cinema that actually had this, um, all these analytics put in it, was actually accepted into the App Store yesterday, some sometime in the morning. So therefore, it looks like we've got really rapid growth. Um, it's uh, it, it's just really as people are upgrading and, and starting to use their app. So so far, it's showing about 18 hours worth of uh, of, of data. So you'll have to you have to imagine a, a lovely slide that has you know number of sessions slowly growing or something like that. But this is the first screen that you get. It shows you the number of sessions at the top, um, application usage, and total exceptions. There's also for those people that have a flotilla of uh, apps, there's also a company dashboard view that show you all your different apps, show you your split on the usage of the apps, um, and where the um, App Savvy book um, uh, brought this in was using it as a, a guide as to what apps you should continue to work on, what, what apps should you update, that sort of thing. Um, so the first thing that it shows is the number of sessions, um, as I said, there's a, a big kick up um, just in the last two days, and you can see the bit of bit of work along the, the line as I've been doing some testing. Um, the frequency of use, which is the number of sessions, and um, it gives you the number of sessions per day, number of sessions that people have used your app in the week and the month. So it gives you an indication. I know um, being at... Um, WWDC, some of the game developers were talking about they were really tightly tracking the the session usage, sort of breaking it down to how long each person spent playing their games and working out what parts of the game were, were really um, the, the, the main parts that were attracting users. But one thing I'm guessing most of you can't see, but down the bottom, and it, they've, they've just added it, is a um, compare to and allows you to choose what category out of the App Store you want to compare it to. It's obviously comparing it to other apps that are using the Flurry API. But the session on the side where it says daily it's one point sessions per day and the benchmark for the entertainment apps is one point sessions, 1.7 sessions per day is actually showing you against the, the median average in the um, iTunes Store. So it gives you a a way to benchmark uh, whether you think your whether your apps more popular than other apps in the in the app store or less popular. Again, a good way to evaluate whether or not you should keep working on your app. Um, so, you know, again, the, although it's interesting, the number of of median sessions per week and month is actually less than the median session number of sessions per day for um, for the benchmark. So I don't don't know what's going on that. I would have thought it would go up, but uh, they um, they tell me that entertainment apps are only used 1.1 sessions per month, but they use 1.7 sessions per day. I don't know. Um, they have an application version showing you the number of versions being used by users. Um, one thing I have noticed with the Flurry API, or the Flurry, sorry, not the API really, the website, is that it updates on a semi-regular basis. So you'll find every there's some things that get updated every day, some things that get updated every couple of hours, um, and uh, the so for example here the top applications by version doesn't even have our new version in the list um, so far. So 
I don't, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure why, but I'm assuming that stats will change. It's a new paradigm, eventually consistent. Yeah. Um, they've got a, a, another, another one that allows you to compare against other people in the App Store is the user interest by category, showing you the number of users for the, for the app and the number of sessions that they use the app. So um, it's hard to tell, but the big lines at the top uh, games and card games are obviously the um, in, in the really popular areas and then working their way down and uh, this is telling they've done some really funky stuff with the statistics because they, they actually tell me for the users of my app that they're, they're, they're big card playing games which obviously means that I'm playing them, one of the card playing games that I play on my um, iPhone on my test iPhone is obviously um, really popular because that's why that's skewed out. But uh, inter interesting, interesting stat. Um, you can also get a geographic view. Um, people were asking about whether it requests the geographic data um, because our app gets your nearby location. We actually push back the geographic information into here, and. The, the app is for the Independent Cinema Association of Australia, so as you'd expect, most of our users are in Australia. But this will become more useful. We're hoping to... Um, there's a, they're, they're partnered with the Independent Cinema Association of New, New Zealand, so <coughs> hoping to get a, a breakdown when we, when we finally get it, uh, some New Zealand cinemas in there. Um, so before I showed you making a, a cinema favourite, unfavourite, you actually get event statistics for every one of those individual events, um, which uh, uh, you break down, you get the same sort of graphs that you got before. Um, you also get a um, list of paths that users go through to get to certain parts of your application. Our application is a tab-based application, so pretty much there's five, you start the session and people go to the, the five different uh, sessions but it will show you paths and if you've got an app that's reasonably complicated with how it's, you might be actually finding that people are taking 10 steps to get where they could go by to or you might be able to shortcut for some people. Um, they also show you the different device models which I know I will be using in future. The one thing I haven't been able to find and I don't, I don't I can actually get these stats from our server but um, I haven't been out, they haven't, I haven't seen a breakdown of what iOS versions the people are using. I assume that it's something that it's either a bug or... Um, Sorry, would they change that after Steve Jobs uh, kicked up Steve? Oh, did they? Because it was detecting other loose versions. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that was the nature of a conflict between Apple and... Uh, yeah. Um, the, the big thing for me, though, is... is working out how many um, users and what type of devices they're using um, as a way of pushing the technology forward because I really hate writing all my stuff for, for iOS 3.0 because there's one manager who says no, every, there's so, we've got thousands of users that are still using um, the iOS 3.0 APIs um, and we slowly push them forward but uh, so this is a way of actually identifying. It also gives you what, what carrier they're using. <coughs> Probably not that useful in terms of uh, um, uh, adjusting how you do things, but knowing whether they're using Wi-Fi or a carrier is probably the most important thing for those apps that are actually downloading a lot of um, data. I've also found sometimes it can be slightly unreliable about what network it's coming from. I've had sometimes people saying, oh, they're coming from Telstra, it's that they're actually using Bitcoin, for example. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's, it's a it's a murky science, I, I'm sure. Um, this is the list of errors. Um, most of the errors you can see are actually occurred during my uh, when I was testing, and uh, there's one error at the end. Um, and then here's the the error reports. So they give you they give you the the, the basic. Uh, the basic string and, and what what the, the main message was, but it looks like they don't have the stack, which I'd be surprised because you strip the debug stuff out of your app anyway. There's a pure crash report on somehow managed to get a stack. Yeah. 
Don't have bugs in your app and solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the dashboard. I'm trying to think. What did I put that in there? Is the errors, is it the ones that you catch and register with Fluri, or Fluri does it automatically? Uh, this is anything that you don't catch. Ah, okay. So anything that's causing the app to crash is getting logged for you before it does how crash. Does, how do they pull it off? Like how, what do they tap into to intercept uh, There was a... Sorry. That one. So all, all it is is they the un, 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 uncaught exception handler Oh, okay. And they just put in their little line of code. So, quick. It's 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 a it's a quick and dirty, but it, it just it's a way of capturing those events. But that actually guarantees that any ridiculous like Siga board or this any cryptic ones will all go for that. And... Oh, if they always kill it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing's going to catch it. <laughs> so memory. I mean, maybe if you, you might be able to put in a signal handler. That will interfere. But yeah. So, for example, if OS decides that it's loading for too long and kills it, then this will not come. No. Yeah, that's a kill, and whether or not the kernel's yeah. letting you catch those signals. You might get it in your iTunes reports eventually yeah. or something. But, um, so, as I said, I have obviously only used the, the um, Flurry API for um, a short while, and I, I can probably grab me in a month's time and I can tell you that it's a bloody mess or it's working fine. Um, but uh, so far, the main thing for me was that it was pretty quick to in install. We, the, the development f for this app is actually paid for by the cinemas, so they pay a, month, a, a monthly fee. And um, so there isn't, a, there isn't a huge amount of development time, so being able to install it and get it all running within a couple of hours is pretty important. Um, so it's quick and easy to install. And the other thing is I need to be able to get stats out of it and it looks like um, we can get some pretty useful stats um, that look pretty good out of it for the cinemas. Yeah. Once you instrument it with this Flurry, what impact it has if uh, the, it has poor connection or in, or in the airplane mode? Like, Does it aggressively try to, to send stuff I, somewhere? Does it have any impact if it's an offline mode? Uh, I, I haven't noticed any impact. Um, so it hasn't crashed my app or done anything nasty like that. They supposedly send. Batch it or? Batch yeah, they, they batch it all up and they supposedly send stats at app launch, at app terminate, and at app relaunch. I recently see there are some strange apps, but unless it, it's a device that should connect, if you try to use it in an airplane mode, they, it takes like 100 times slower than. So I thought maybe because of this instrumentation kind of yeah. thing, they're trying to call home or call Flurry. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. But airplane mode isn't a high priority for our app because all our data comes from our server. So if you're in airplane mode, you pretty much you can get a list of the cinemas and that's about as far as you're going to get in our app. Yeah, so in the case of your app, it doesn't make sense. So, but I, I haven't noticed. I mean, we, we've done testing in airplane mode and killing the, killing the, the app partway, or killing the data connection partway through and things like that. And it was all, it all fine and it never slowed it down. So mm -hmm. nothing that I've noticed. So the other sort of development and techie thing. And as I said, I, we got lots of ideas out of the book other than this, but uh, obviously want to keep this sort of slightly cocoa heads, so a bit towards the de developer. Um, the other thing that I got out of it was a thing called, um, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, whether it's Appy Raider or App I Raider. I think it's App I Raider. App <laughs> 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 Um, unfortunately, Keynote I've made it all uppercase, so it's, I think it's app I Raider. But basically, um, I actually just assumed, um, stupidly, that um, this was actually something that Apple did, that, because I've got a bunch of apps that actually pop up and say, oh, we noticed you've been using it for a bunch of time, um, and uh, would you like to rate it in the store? Um, and I think this is particularly pertinent, because I noticed Apple's talking about they're going to start changing the way that the, the, the way apps are ranked in the store, so they're not just going to go purely off downloads. What, what magic they're going to do, but maybe the ratings will, will play a part in, in time. But wouldn't this frustrate the users and they'll go into App Store specifically for the reason to rate it down because they maybe. Salty but this a, a, Apple, very, Apple very well might just push apps up that have gotten a lot of ratings and they don't care what rating you got. I, I look at heaps of popular apps in the store and lots of them have got one star ratings. So. 
Um, you have a free one, usually, because yeah. people still get them. But... Yeah, I, I don't know, but... Can you configure, does this run every time? Or can no, no, no. So, I'll, I'll explain how, how it runs. So, basically, um, th this is... Um, I'll, I'll show you how it installs, and then I'll tell you how, how it runs. Basically, the reason I chose this, and it's the only one mentioned in the book, actually, but it's simple, it's lightweight, and it's easy to install. Um, it's so, free. free, yeah. It, it's, all you need to do to install it in your app is put the a header and a um, code file in your um, in your app, add your Apple generated software ID into the header file of the um, app I rate a header file, and then in your um, uh, the application did finish launching with options. You say app I radar app launched yes, and there's also one for app will enter foreground app I radar app enter foreground equals yes. You just call those. those so change change the header file, put those two lines in, and it all works. Um, what it does is unless you configure it differently, after after a user's used your app for 28 days, they'll then get bugged to rate it in the App Store. So it's someone who's using your app, at, well, they've used it for at least a month after, you, so you're not catching the people who've just installed it. I think there's a, an easy to use option that just changes it to be seven days. If you, want to, if you, if you think your app's only ever going to be used for seven days and then you want the rating in the store. But um, yeah, so it, uh, after 28 days, so it's not like the first thing that the user sees, something that's sitting there and after, after a bunch of time um, it the will. The only problem with that is we actually use it. They come up saying, "Oh, do you want to rate this app?" I'm like, "Oh, well, not now. Remind me later." Every single time I launch the app, I go, "Oh, not now. Remind me later." I want a review of that. And eventually, this will frustrate you. So go and go and do it. Well, there's a no thanks. So there's <laughs> it's, it's one button. There's a no thanks. It's like I do want to rate. I'm just now. <laughs> but oh, does the book has any metrics? How is this more effective as comparing to put some button in an about page saying, you know, we, we beg you to rate our app on our no, cover? No, but the, the book does actually talk not so much about putting a rating in the about screen, so either in the settings or in a hidden part of the app, but they do talk about giving information to getting to a website that, and they talk about, you know, setting up forums and, and you know, building out that sort of support services and and so it's, it's, I'm curious about effectiveness of this bringing up into a face as opposed to just humbly sitting in about page and saying. I've heard a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal evidence of these games that it's very effective actually to get rating. Yeah. Like a lot of people who play games, like people are playing your games, but like most people who, who hate the game will only play it once and they'll never get that message. Yeah. People play it over and over again, they get that message, they go, oh yeah, because they like the game. So, my, I mean, it's all anecdotal, but I know a lot of people who use that, yeah. that sort of strategy and it gets, like their ratings go through the roof. Yeah, and as I said, I mean, Apple at present is pretty much, from what we've seen, just doing it on downloads. So the more downloads you can get, the better. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, you know they they start changing it to to highlight apps that are actually getting good ratings versus just having a big marketing campaign. It used to be what you when you uninstalled an app, it was saying, "Would you like yeah, to rate me now?" And that was really bad because yeah. all the yeah. ratings were yeah. So, and I, th I think that's where part of this came from was actually getting, providing something for developers that is an alternative to Apple's. When you when you're deleting the app, <laughs> <laughs> giving it a rating. Q Q Q minus Q. Uh, yeah. So as I said. Um, <coughs> I, I found there's a lot of information in the book that's, and it's the majority of the information is about, for example, they're talking about how they set up the marketing campaigns before the before. So marketing is a step that you actually start before you even start doing development. So there's a lot of ideas about how they think apps should be built, um, and it gives you a lot of thought, especially. And I know there's a, a, a lot of people. There's someone tonight who put their hand up and said, "Oh, yeah, I built my own app." And put it in the store and, and seen these things and um, so you know if, if you're if you are a developer and you you, you are just getting started and th there's this whole world of things that you've never thought of that uh, um, this book will probably highlight whether you do all of them is, a, is another thing um, but uh, as I said 
on there, for, for those of you who use the um, Kindle store, it's $3.99. No idea. So it's probably $3.50 if it's in US dollars, I think it is. Um, or you can buy it as a book from Amazon. I think it's $20 or $30 book. Um, and it was written, I think, around the iOS 4.1, 4.0. Um, not that there's a lot of code in there. So it's still reasonably up to date. And again, most of the concepts are um, universal. They're, they're not, a new version of the iOS isn't going to kill all these concepts about marketing and, and new strategies and, and things. Subtle things will change. For example, all the Xcode examples are in Xcode 3.2 point something or other. So, um, with that, um, highly recommended. And question? I have one question on the uh, use of the analytics. Yep. So, uh, I'll just add a quick look. Um, neither in the description of the application nor in the settings do you give your user any warning that analytics is being used? No. How do you think that sits with uh, a um, user and B the actual conditions? There is a big, big crackdown on applications sending you data without yeah. using user special profile data, which is yeah. what this is. Yeah, as long as it's in the UDID, you're not breaking the. Uh, That's a true matter. It's any user identifiable or something like that. I can't so that. it's not just user identifiable. Oh. Yeah. So according, according to according to the level of opinion we have, is you must give the user an option to turn it off. Do you have to tell them that you're doing it okay? So you can actually, so you need to put it in terms of conditions or something, but you must give an option to turn it off. It's, it's fine that if you're collecting data about the user or their interactions, yep. you must give an option to turn it off. Put it in the settings and they'll never find it, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I, I read through what they said on the look, and I've, I don't I don't have a team of lawyers. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I do, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I read through what the flurry what they said on the flurry website and what people were saying on the forums and yeah. and and admittedly we we've changed the the, um, the description. We haven't actually put it in there that it, it does collect analytics, but. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, the, well, I don't know how, how much Apple actually looks at it, but it, it got approved two days ago, so um, from our we just, perspective... We won't post the video, Luke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Australia, because not being an Australian citizen, but um, is there, there's privacy laws in Australia about... Um, Recording information about customers and, and, and stuff and how that applies to something. Mm -hmm. but part of it refers to the information you need to keep, and also it depends on how large the organisation is. If you're a small organisation, you can get away with more. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and on a related note to what Kev was saying, um, the project I'm working on at the moment, we've also got a large team of lawyers, and they were expressing concern about the same sort of thing um, because uh, in that organisation they use Omniture, which is one of the ones you yeah. listed. Um, and so, yeah, the, if we use so, that service that they yeah. already use so, for their web stuff, we're going to have to provide yeah. similar sort of functionality. So, I've actually got a question back for Kevin. Yeah, do, do, you, do you have an option to, to opt out of uh, analytics for your website? Uh, yes. You do? Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, so um, it's actually, you don't have an option to opt out because there's no option to opt out yeah. because there's no requirement, as I've always read, in the terms and conditions of entering our store. For a website, we do let people know that we collect the data. That's okay. The terms and conditions. So yeah. that's, that's explicitly called out in the terms and conditions. But we don't, I uh, don't think they have a method of turning it off. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it'd be nearly impossible on a website. It, it was really more the, um, the one of the conditions is basically you've got to allow users to turn this stuff off. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all the time. Unless you're always going to go to the door. Any other? Yeah, if you're, no, even, even, it's even curious around whether the advertising system can, can grab it. It's yeah. really, really. No. Yeah, I, so, I, I think it's one of those things that it, this, this stuff is, is pretty new, so everyone's still trying to work out which way is up in terms of. Uh, there seems to be a crunch in the US around this, uh, and the collection of data is originally 
Um, oh. so, so for anyone who, who, who's looking at doing this, make sure you put in a settings screen as well. <laughs> I think it's also more relevant for larger organisations. You know, yeah. Bigger pockets, larger target for litigation. So <laughs> if you're just a one-man band, they're probably not going to go after you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just kill up from App Store. If, if Apple comes oh, about yeah. enforcing it, then they'll kill yeah. 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 Were there any other, any other questions for, for Luke on that stuff? Uh, I'll just do the one yeah. one. Yep. If you, if you have a setting part, would it be relatively easy to turn off all that collection data? Yeah, you just wouldn't call, you just wouldn't call the, the API. Yeah. So you need to put a if guards around each call? Right? No. No, you just, you just turn off the, the, the oh, tracking. Oh, it's a one-big switch on the API. Yeah. So We'll wrap it up there, guys, because we've got some pizza get, getting cold out in the foyer. But uh, thanks, Luke, for that talk. Many thanks to Luke Tupper for presenting this month. Thanks also to realestate.com.au for hosting this month's event. You can download the realestate.com.au app from the iTunes App Store. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, Visit us on the web at melbournecocoheads.com or follow Melbourne Coco on Twitter.